Wow, there are a lot of you. That's awesome to see. You know, I got some emails over the last 24 hours, um, people saying how excited they were to come to this talk. Um, I want you to know I'm humbled by that and uh, also a little intimidated. I hope this is good. So um, I wanted to start by showing you how crazy success can be uh, through some charts and numbers uh, and then maybe paint a little bit more realistic picture uh, for, what, for what it takes. Where do you got to point this thing? <laughs> oh, there we go. That way. <laughs> Up and to the right. Yes. All right, here's what we all hope, right? You launch your company, and in the first year, you see hockey stick growth. Um, and for us, this is number of guests who booked uh, through, through Airbnb uh, cumulatively. And uh, pay attention to the numbers on the y-axis as I flip through this. So hopefully, year two comes along, and you keep growing, still hockey stick growth. But then year three, year four, and if you're really lucky, in year five, you still have that hockey stick. Now what happens when you append five hockey sticks together? What does that look like? That's a really big hockey stick. And so it took four years to service our first four million guests. But in the last nine months alone, we've done another five million. And Brian was fortunate enough to come to startup school uh, back in 2010, so three years ago. Fun fact. You know, back then, it seemed like we were a pretty big deal, but since then, we've grown 73x. That's just like mind-bending, right? Like, you just lose track of what that means. And on any given night, we have 150,000 people around the world staying on our accommodations. So, this makes it look easy, right? Um, it's not, of course. If you are this successful, it will be the hardest thing you ever do. Uh, think about it in terms of like the Olympics or something, right? If you're going to go compete in the Olympics for gold, what would that take? What kind of training would you have? You'd probably start pretty young and you'd work up towards that, right? And you might go to the Olympics multiple times before you actually succeed. And I really think that's similar to the startup journey. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, our journey. So I got started at a pretty young age, I was 12. When I was 12, one day I was home sick from school and I picked up a book on my dad's uh, bookshelf. He was an electrical engineer and computer enthusiast. Uh, so he just happened to have a book, I picked it up, I started reading it, I got into programming. Taught myself how to program, started publishing my work on the internet. At the age of 14, uh, someone saw what I was doing and called me up and said, hey, I saw your work. I'll pay you $1,000 if you write me this program. So I go tell my dad. I said, Dad, someone on the internet wants to pay me $1,000. He's like, son, no one's going to pay you $1,000 on the internet. <laughs> I'm like, whatever, Dad. I'm going to do this for fun anyways. So I write this program in like 30 days, and the guy actually pays me. And this is the beginning of a business that I run throughout high school. I make enough money to pay uh, my tuition, go to college. Um, but more importantly, it built confidence in me. And you need that confidence. I mean, this is going to be a long journey. You're not always going to be successful. You're going to fail more times than you succeed. And somewhere you need to get that confidence so you persevere. And for me, I was fortunate enough to have that at a very young age. So I go to school, and perhaps surprisingly, coming out of school, I, uh, I get a corporate job. And uh, well, I found myself not learning very much. I wasn't satisfied by the pace. And after seven months, I, I quit. And when I go to quit, and boss says, oh, you can't leave us. You're our most productive engineer. Which I chuckled to myself because half the time I'd been trading stocks anyways. And so I took this as a sign. Like, this is a place that I wasn't learning. And on this journey, every experience should be additive. It should be, it should be building up to that moment, right, when you go to the Olympics. And I found myself not, not, not being challenged there and I had to move on. And so I headed out west and joined a startup. And there I learned everything not to do. 
which is actually really valuable. Um, as soon as I joined, the two lead engineers quit. I should have taken that as a warning sign. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was a good experience. I helped take a vision, distill it to a product spec, hire a team, build a product in nine months. I learned a lot of things. Um, it was challenging. I worked really hard. It didn't end the way I had hoped, but along the way, I learned a ton of stuff. And I think back, and there's a lot of things that I've done, hobbies, projects, favors, stuff like that. A lot of them I lost interest in, maybe they weren't successful, but thinking about it now, every one of those experiences helped me to be successful now. Every one of those exper experiences prepared me for Airbnb. Um, and I encourage you to think about your experiences that way. So when I moved out to the West Coast, I needed a place to live. And so naturally, I went to Craigslist. And there, I met Joe and moved into Rouse Street. We were roommates, just by chance. And Rouse Street is also where we ran the company out of for a couple of years. And living with Joe, I noticed a couple things about him. First, we were both up late into the night working on our projects. We'd work a long day at work, and then we'd stay up even later working on different side projects, uh, and even on the weekend. And it's rare that you find people with that kind of work ethic. That's something really special. You know, the worst thing is to have a partner that doesn't work as hard as you. So I noticed that about Joe. I also noticed that Joe could do a lot of things I couldn't do. He was a designer, and he was making beautiful physical products. He had just an immense mind for creativity. Um, and we started helping each other out. And we're like, wow, we got really complementary skills. And so we kind of filed that away. Meanwhile, Joe knew Brian from back at the Rhode Island School of Design. They had been classmates. And at graduation, Joe had told Brian, someday I think we're going to start a company together. I'm not sure if Brian took that seriously at the time. But fast forward, and the three of us decided we should start a company together. That with our skill sets, we could take on anything. And I got, can't stress this enough. Choosing your partners has got to be maybe the most important decision you'll ever make whether uh, you know, personally and, and, and love or otherwise in business. You can change your idea. You can pivot your company. You can't change your partners without starting over. And so I see so many people rushing into these relationships. I mean, you should really give that a lot of thought. This is something that hopefully will last years. So the question was, what are we going to do at this point? This is like January 2008. And so Joe and Brian tell me about something that had happened a couple months ago. In October 2007, they had decided to quit their jobs to become entrepreneurs, also known as unemployed. <laughs> and at the same time, the rent on the apartment was raised, and I decided to move out. And they didn't have enough money now to pay rent, so they had a math problem. Well, they're both designers, and they just so happened that there was going to be an international design conference in San Francisco the following weekend. And that on the homepage for this conference, they saw that all the hotels were sold out. So they thought to themselves, why don't we rent out that vacant room to designers who need a place to stay? But that room had no furniture. So, well, Joe had some airbeds, though. So instead of calling it a bed and breakfast, they called it an air bed and breakfast, right? And they put up a simple WordPress blog and emailed a few designers, uh, bloggers, who wrote about it. And within 24 hours, three designers wrote to them and said they wanted to stay. There was a 35-year-old woman from Boston, a father of four from Utah, and a man from India. Not what they were expecting. They were expecting guys like themselves who wanted to crash. And here they had three very different people who wanted to stay. But they had a great experience that weekend. Not only did they have a place to stay and make $1,000, but they all went to the conference together and had a great time, so much so that the woman from Boston ended up moving to San Francisco six months later, and the man from India invited Joe and Brian to his wedding a couple years later. So like real relationships <laughs> were formed out of this just this, this one weekend project. And when we talked and thought about this, we're like, that's powerful. Something happened here. Maybe we can do this for 
other events, other people. And so that's what uh, we talked about, and that's what they were sort of pitching me on. I was a little hesitant. So as the engineer amongst us, they're both designers, I was very cautious knowing that, you know, these projects, they can kind of go on and on and on and, uh, you know, scope creep, and you got to be realistic about what you can accomplish. So we talked it over a bit, and they wanted things like verification and reviews and Facebook integration. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, <laughs> you know, and we wanted to do it in like a month, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm good, but not that good. Um, and so they finally pitched me on air bed and breakfast light, right? <laughs> Which is really the same thing, minus a couple of those fancy features. And after a couple beers, I agreed to do this. <laughs> Sometimes that's how it happens. And so we were off and running. And again, this, we were making a pretty simple site, right? Uh, we had different events in our database, and you could put up air beds or extra rooms in association with those events. It was really directory service. There was no payments. There was no reviews. It was really just a search engine and classifieds. So we cranked this out in three weeks. And our whole goal is to launch it for South by Southwest because you know, we had heard Twitter had launched there the year before, and we're like, you know, so that's a sign we should launch in 2008 at South by. So we cranked this thing out, and about, let's say about 12 people put up properties, or, or rooms, we'll say, and uh, Brian goes down there and actually stays on an Airbnb, and it's a great experience. The host picks him up at the airport, brings him to the house, the guy's wife makes them both dinner, the room's all set up, at the end of the night, the host asks Brian, uh, do you have the money? Because this was before we handled the transaction. And Brian's like, oh man, I forgot to go to the ATM. And the host said, oh, hey, no problem. Just uh, bring it tomorrow. Yeah, okay. So the next night, they're in the kitchen again. And the host says, oh, Brian, uh, were you able to get, get that money? Brian had forgotten again. <laughs> and suddenly things got weird, right? Because this guy started thinking to himself, who is Brian, this guy I just met on the internet, who's not fulfilling his end of the bargain and, and paying for my hospitality? And, and the hospitality basically wore off at that point. And so reflecting on this, on this um, experience, we thought to ourselves, oh man, wouldn't it be good if we could just handle the money up front so that like, upon arrival, uh, the focus could be on hospitality, right? Um, and, and so this is why we later started handling the payments. It wasn't because we wanted a business model or something. It was all in the interest of the experience. Um, you know, people also afterwards were asking us, like, I'm going to London, not for an event, but I still want to use your service. And we're like, oh, no, you know, it has to be for an event, whatever. And they're like, wait a minute, does it? And so we came up with a new vision, which was, uh, why don't we make it just as easy to book someone's home as a hotel, and we had this motto, three clicks to book it. So basically, you would just go to the homepage, like any travel site, type in where you want to go, look through some search results, and then click into a profile, and if you liked it, you hit book it. So three clicks to book it. So, down at South By, Brian met Michael Seibel. Now, Michael at the time was CEO of Justin.tv, later than Social Cam, later to be acquired last year. And Brian pitched Michael on what we were doing. And of course, he was pitching it, right? And Michael was like, wow, that sounds really cool. You know, I know these, uh, these, these angel investors who, like, over dinner could write you, like, a 50K check. Like, I'll make those introductions. And we were, like, super excited by this, right? Because we didn't know any investors. How were we going to get money? And so, the, the, the next day or next week, you know, Michael gets the time to actually look at the website. And then he realizes that like, we had actually really been pitching him like heavy. And uh, maybe we weren't as far along as we had made it out to be. And so he says, you know, I'll make those introductions, but before I do that, you really, there's a few things you need to do. There's a few things you need to build, uh, progress you need to show before this is going to be realistic. And so, every week, Joe and Brian would head down to the offices at Justin.tv, meet with Michael, give him a progress update, uh, try to keep him excited about what we were doing. And, uh, you know, things got tough around this point. So I, at this point, decided to move back to Boston. So I had been doing long distance with my girlfriend for three years. 
Um, and I had to basically figure things out. Did I want to get married or not? So, you know, I had some other priorities in my life that had suddenly come up. And I was in Boston. And, you know, the, suddenly the pace really slowed down, right? And, and meanwhile, we got these things that were supposed to build for Michael. And Michael's wondering, as they come in every week, like, man, like, why is it taking you so long to build these features, right? Like, oh, your co-founder, he must not be a good, good engineer. And like, meanwhile, I'm like, guys, have you like, been straight with Michael and told him that like, you know, I'm doing some other things and like, set his expectations? But of course they hadn't, right? Because they, they wanted to make sure he didn't lose interest, right? I mean, we, we were desperate. We needed to raise money. And I tell you this story because like, this, is the, this is real life. Like, this is how it is. And sometimes your partnership isn't always high fives, right? There's a lot of stress when you're starting a company and no one's getting paid. And you got to work through those moments. So eventually, we get it done. And Michael makes those introductions, those angel investors. And so we, uh, we, we start having these meetings. And I'm still in Boston. So Joe and Brian are going to the meetings. And you know, I, I would always ask, how did the meeting go? And I'm like, oh, yeah, they, they found it like, really interesting. They're going like, to get back to us soon. Right? Like really vague statements. Right? I'm like, oh, OK, that's good, I guess. So, you know, only later did I kind of get the full story about what was going on. So this one time, they go down to University Cafe, meet with this, this, uh, this well-known angel investor. And um, the guy has a smoothie, and they're pitching him. The guy's just drinking a smoothie, just kind of nodding his head, listening. Halfway through it, he just gets up and leaves. He doesn't even finish the smoothie. <laughs> and Joe and Brian are like, did he have to use the restroom? Maybe put some money in the meter? They like sit around for half an hour. He never comes back. <laughs> and they're like, you know, what the? F you know, like, <laughs> is this how it is? I mean, but, you know, I guess, I guess we didn't have much to show at that point. We weren't, we weren't ready for it, I guess. Um, this other time happened to coincide with one of my trips out. And I'm like, oh, great. I get to go to one of these pitches finally. And so the night before, we're looking at the slide deck, kind of reviewing who's going to do what. And we come to this slide, right? And it's like, how much money are we going to make three years from now, like in 2011 or something, right? And it's like $200 million three years from now. I'm like, oh, guys, like, if you do that math, like, that's, you know, how you break it out here. That's like 30,000 transactions per day. Like, that doesn't sound realistic. Like, they're going to, like, the, you know, the BS meter is going to go off on that. <laughs> so I'm like, how about, like, 20 million? That's more realistic. And they're like, okay, sure. You know where this story's going. So the next day, we drive down to Sand Hill. We're pitching the VC. And we come to this slide. And they had changed it to this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, I don't think it actually mattered too much. I don't think the investor was interested in this from the start. Um, but I was like, guys, come on. Like, what, what is this all about? And Brian's like, oh, you know, I was talking to Sam Altman. And he's like, he told me that, like, investors don't want M's. They want B's, baby. <laughs> And it's true, investors want bees. But we hadn't connected the dots between the airbeds and the billions yet. So it didn't work out. So at this point, we kind of put the fundraising on hold. It's clearly not working out. I think we burnt all our leads. And um, well, on the horizon is the Democratic National Convention uh, coming up in Denver. And we're reading about this event. And it's going to be held at the stadium. Stadium holds like 80,000 people. We look it up. There's like only 17,000 hotel rooms in Denver. We're like, OK, people are going to need our solution. Um, we use this as a basically a rallying call to get focused and build that new vision we had, that three clicks to book it. Um, you know, we hadn't really made much progress on that. So we said, OK, it's only three months away. If we start now and are really focused, we can get this out in time. And we're going to handle the payments and do reviews and all that. And so we hustle. We launch maybe a couple weeks before the event. Uh, we get like 800 properties on there the first week. I mean, sure enough, like the locals are looking to get out of town, make some extra money. Um, and sure enough, the news is doing stories like, hey, historic event. All these people want to participate, but they can't afford to. There's no place to stay, et cetera. So we're like, whoa, like perfect. So we start writing to like some local blogs saying, we actually have 800 properties that are definitely available. Uh, you should you know, check us out or, or write something. 
And they do. And like within a day, that's picked up by the local news. And like within a day later, like CNN International picks it up. And we're doing like video interviews, right, with CNN. And it's we're like, whoa, yeah, like this is what launching your company should be like, right? Like a lot of attention, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of clicks to this website. Yeah, but a week later, there was nothing. It was back to square one. And this is uh, Paul Graham's classic diagram of a, a life cycle of a startup. And it's so true. I mean, everybody goes through this. You launch your company, you get like a lot of attention, you get this big spike, but it really doesn't matter. Because like a week later, you realize that everyone's attention has moved on, you're not really relevant, who cares? And unfortunately, that's the beginning of something called the trough of sorrow. And this is like the worst. It's a really hard period where you work really hard and nothing you do matters. It's very demoralizing. And so basically between August and the end of the year, it's, it was only four months, but it seemed like an eternity, we worked really hard and nothing we did seemed to matter. And at the same time, the whole financial crisis happens, right? And the markets collapse, and Sequoia sends out this presentation saying, like, no one's going to be able to raise money again, and, you know, it's time to start saving your money, et cetera. And we're like, oh, just like on top of everything, like, it was already hard enough to get investors to give us money, and now this. And it really seemed like the end of the road. Like, we were really asking ourselves, when do you know it's time to quit? And I think we've probably all thought about that, right? What we realized was, before we can quit, we got to get, give it 100%. And uh, Michael Seibel, who'd still been giving us advice along the way, he saw the state we were in, and he's like, guys, you got to get focused. He had gone through Y Combinator with Justin.tv. He's like, this will be good for you. So like, the application was like, do that night. So we like, totally scrambled, submitted an app, and um, got accepted for an interview, did the interview. I don't think PG liked our idea. He actually told us later he didn't like it at all. I mean, it was pretty obvious, actually, from the interview. Like, the interview went off the rails within the first minute, and he was trying to like, pitch us on something else. <laughs> Not a good sign. Not a good sign. Um, but we did convince him of one thing, which was that we were determined, that we had persevered through a lot, and that we knew how to create things. And he basically said later, I thought you guys were cockroaches, right? And he's got this, this saying, you know, the hardest thing is you need people who will never give up, right? You've got to persevere. There's going to be so many setbacks, and he's looking for cockroaches. So we arrive at Y Combinator, super excited. And again, like, this is our, our three-month period to get really focused and we get really regimented, all right? So I moved back from, from Boston, back to the West Coast. We're all living together. We're waking up at 8 a.m., going to bed at midnight. We're doing everything together. We're, we're uh, going to the gym, eating. I'm sleeping at the foot of Joe's bed, on an air bed, of course. Um, it's 100% focus. We're doing this six or seven days a week. And meanwhile, you know, there's this financial crisis. PG tells us, like, no one's going to be able to raise money at the end of this thing, so it's up to you to get to profitability. And so we have this goal of ramen profitability by, uh, by March, which is basically for us $1,000 a week, enough to pay rent and buy ramen. And we make this graph, we update it every week, and we put it on the mirror in the bathroom, we put it over the fireplace, everywhere. Like, we saw this graph throughout the day, and it made us focus. And so there's a few pieces of advice that we got at kind of the start of YC that made the world a difference. And, and one was this thing that Paul Buchheit said. Paul, Paul is uh, the uh, creator of Gmail. And he basically said, it's better to have a few users who love you than a thousand users that like you, right? Really find those few evangelists and build for them. So we kind of put that in the back of our head. And meanwhile, PG said, do things that don't scale. And like we had been thinking about like how do we make this website where people can completely do it themselves, fully automated, like hands off, like that's what the web's all about, right? And he's like, no, it's okay, like do things that don't scale. And he says, so where are your users? We say, well, our users are everywhere. And he's like, well, where are most of your users? We say, okay, uh, New York. So he's like, go to New York. 
meet your users. And we're like, aren't we supposed to be here at YC doing like, you know, in Mountain View and stuff? He's like, no, just, just go there and meet them all. So that's what we do. We go to, to New York, we meet every single user, all 40 of them. <laughs> <laughs> it was a start, you gotta start somewhere. That's a manageable number. And so, you know, beforehand we're calling up these users and we're saying, oh, um, you know, we can send a professional photographer over to your, your place and get some pictures taken, would you like that? And they're like, oh yeah, sure. So uh, then Joe and Brian show up, right? <laughs> they're the professional photographers, like, hey, co-founders of the company, you're here to take pictures. <laughs> a little weird, but, you know, they're already there, so they opened the door, took the pictures. And um, while they're there, they sat at the computer, gave them a little lesson, got some feedback. We would invite them out to the bar later on to get some beer. Built a rapport, told them our story, really tried to get them the route for us. And so we'd then go back home and we'd then call them up and we'd say, hey, looking at your profile and, um, you know, you only have a paragraph on there. Uh, you got a really nice place. Do you mind if we, like, help describe it a little better, right? Just fill it out. Change your title. And by the way, the price seems a little high. Could we just maybe start at $75 a night? You know, if you get too many inquiries, you can always raise it. So we could have never asked this of people if they had never met us, right? But because they were rooting for us, it made all the difference. And so by the end of this exercise, we had 20 or 40 really good-looking properties in New York that we had basically fully curated. When we did that, that's when they started getting booked. That's when we started getting traction. So... Around this time, it's towards the end of, um, of uh, YC, and there's a, a speaker that comes every week uh, during dinner. And so that week, Greg McAdoo from Sequoia Capital was coming. And we had saw Greg speak at startup school, actually, uh, earlier that year. And Greg was talking about, like, great surfers and, like, big waves, like, real figuratively, and talking about how they invested in companies like Intel and Cisco and how, like, these were the kind of companies that Sequoia is in the business of finding. And so, like, you know, of course, it, we're like, well, that's not us, right? Like, we're not Cisco. <laughs> but, you know, here he was at dinner, and so, of course, we had to pitch him, right? That's what you do. And so after dinner, we show him our stuff, walk him through it, and then he's like, let me see if I got this straight. And he basically re-pitches it back to us. And he does like a way better job. And we're like, yeah, like, like what you said. <laughs> like, it was, we couldn't believe it. Like this guy gets it. Like he gets even better than we do. And so within two weeks, we had a term sheet that we had signed and we raised 600,000 in seed from them. And I mean, from there, it's been up and to the right. And you know, all this, though, had to happen before that happened, right? Um, and, you know, kind of reflecting back, on one hand, it looks like so much happened so quickly, right? Like, how could you ask for more? And, I mean, how could you? But it looks really easy. And it did happen, you know, relatively quickly. At the same time, that journey was a really tough one. And I, what I want you to take away is that, this is a long journey, and perseverance is what matters the most. And you might fail this time, but if you think of every single experience as a building block to that final competition, if you make sure you pace yourself so that you don't quit too early uh, and you know, have to basically bail, you can do amazing things. And so I hope that today uh, you were not only inspired, but you got some practical tips and I expect to see a lot of great things from you. Thank you.